If they want to send any questions. If they want to um, send any questions, they can do one of two things. They can un unmute themselves uh -oh. and ask you a question. Okay. Or with the chat, um, they can just um, type write it, it okay. type it in. Gotcha. And when you have it, um, you know, when you're presenting and everything, if you these two little arrows that touch each other uh -huh. right there, yeah. you can pull that down. And then if they have a question, it'll pop up. Oh, all the way. Mm -hmm. So easy. <laughs> can I tell you? <laughs> um, and if you, you want to um, use the cameras, so they can see you instead of just hear you. Say that again. Oh, to use the cameras. To use the cameras so they can see you. They don't need to see you. So I'm thinking through the slides. Okay. Um, then we have an activity at the end, but that they can do on their own. We're just going to kind of work through it together. Okay. Um, wait for the world. Okay. One more question, because we were talking about tables. Do you think it would be too tight for tables for this? We have about 16 people. Um, I'm thinking we need to do that. Take it, yeah. Um, depending on your activity, yeah. Um, if they, if you think they would need a table to write on, write on or, or a laptop or a laptop or something mm -hmm. like that, then mm -hmm. a table might be nice. Okay. But it depends on how long it's going to take them to do the activity. If it's just a few. Words. So we could be we could be taking notes throughout. Yeah. So we could do it either way. Shane might have done it this way though because we have the forum. Uh, yeah, she might be doing it. So we'll leave it this way. Whatever's easy. This is the first time. I'll give it a go. And trust me, they'll tell me. Is the first? Is it the first <laughs> Wednesday in the month we have the forum? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, we'll be doing it. Thank you. You're welcome. You're welcome. All righty, room. Let's see what we can do. Make it work. Get you up here. So then you go. So you can put the remainder you want tables. Oh, And are you okay um, with that? I think so. Um, so as it is now, they can call in and they'll be able to. See the slides and they will see the slides and they will be able to hear you. It's okay. also recording. Okay. Um, <clears throat> yep. Is it on? Yes. Has it been that long? It's the last class. I cannot believe it's been weeks. that long. Two weeks. <laughs> Mm, 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 mm. Sorry about it. Bittersweet. Appropriate. Yes. <laughs> so you can use that or, of course, the keyboard, and then if you feel brave and want to walk around, you can do this as well. <laughs> but you yeah. can't use the laser pointer because it won't. See how lovely, uh -huh. but it works lovely on the drinks. <laughs> no worries. Thank you so much. You're welcome. We won't make it work. You're welcome. Awesome. So that got y'all set up. So they can just call in, as I say. And it should be yeah. Happy. Well, this is Hudson Alpha. Oh, okay. This is Hudson Alpha. We each have. We want. We want. We need a help. Okay. Good. Yeah, we have. You know, we now have a training program. In partnership with some alpha genetics. Oh wow! Mm -hmm. So there's that time we have a few grad students who did their grad work here and now doing postdoc. Oh, up there. Yeah. And they're saying, hey, well, we want some more to all in. So cool. maybe we tie into the CCTS network. So I know we talked long about mm -hmm. that management stuff. Yeah. So that helps us. Works all in. So this is lab management? It, it's the lab management course. Okay. Yeah. This is actually the third class. Okay. First one worked, and second one didn't. Second one didn't, second one didn't at all. <laughs> I think it was all there, frankly, but. Yeah. That's okay. Because they, they can hear us. We can hear and see them. Uh -huh. They can see us, but they can hear us. That's how we know. 
trust me, it, I have been thrown into it, and it's like, you are brave. learn. <laughs> I have teenagers for. I know. <laughs> Mine's living in Florida now, so it's like, have at it. Hopefully not in Florida now. No, he is in Orlando. Okay. So I think he's going to get some rain and yeah, some wind and maybe some, some yucky, some yucky days, but hopefully. Yeah. Yeah. He's watching us like, okay, mm -hmm. do a collar and say, run! <laughs> yeah. I don't know if I'm going to put a little more first time. Oh. Yeah. That's okay. Dippy, dippy, dippy. Okay. Take the girls. <laughs> <laughs> Mine's on his own and totally oblivious to everything except <laughs> what he's doing is all, you know, tunnel vision. So I was like, okay, that's why I'm thinking about oh do I need to call him yeah. and say, did you know that there's a hurricane oh, for you? <laughs> well, I got one who's a senior in high school and one that's a sophomore in high school. So, getting ready. Hmm. Getting ready to, to do the college thing. Yeah. She and Dad are going on the last college trip tomorrow. 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 Don't Where's she living? Away. <laughs> tomorrow. Oh, oh, uh, away. <laughs> yeah. She. Uh, we we did several trips up to the northeast. Um, my husband and I are gone. Yeah. So I think we transferred our sense of place to to, to the kids. Um, but she's interviewed at schools in Maine, upstate New York, outside of Philly. And she's going to Iowa tomorrow. Mm -hmm. Wow. So, okay. Exciting. Yes. Nerve wracking. Nerve wracking. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Dad's having a really hard time. I'm just going to say, you can't. Yeah. It'll be all right. The little brother's like, yeah, we're going to get the gun. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oblivious as well. Mine was <clears throat> Michael was so lost about the first year that he was there. And so we Skyped like a couple of times a week, you know, just, just to keep mm -hmm. in touch and make sure he was yep. okay and he was fine and he found a girlfriend. <laughs> That's all it took. He's, and from then on, he's just sailed right on. He's like, okay, there he is. And here he is, 26, living in Orlando all by himself with a beautiful boy. boy. Don't right. tell me what to do. I know how to do it. And leave me alone. I said, yes, sir. Yes, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay, we all did. Yep. So keep the mistakes and fall flat on your face. And it's okay. Been there, done that. That's true. <laughs> 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 oh, I sent them two emails. Remember to come to Pete's house. Yeah, come to Pete's Do you know where you're going to be? Yeah, I sent them. The direction. The direction. <laughs> yes. Address. The address. Yes, I have that one. Um, in several places where I just copy paste, copy paste, copy paste. <laughs> yeah. I hope they get a good turnout to the industry thing. Um, look like they were a lot. Busy. Every year that they've done that, it's just been absolutely nuts. They've had that entire team full. Oh, wow. And so I haven't even looked out the window this time. So oh. I don't know what they've got. That's a good one. I saw them setting up yesterday. Has been very successful. Wow. Yeah, they have been good to know. Wow. That's cool. Mm. Mm. Fun, fun. Mm. Well, Dr. Benos. Oh, no. I, I was thinking about him. Yeah. It was this week, I think. I was thinking about him. Because mm -hmm. 
So I ran across, he used to send me his um, PowerPoints because mm -hmm. they were too busy mm -hmm. and he wanted all the stuff to stripped out of them. He wanted them, you know, just kind of not so busy and mm -hmm. a little laid back, a little mm -hmm. more laid back because somebody had done them for him. And um, he found out that I could do just about anything with PowerPoint. And I was like, okay, send them to me. And, oh, I'll take care of them. So I stripped down all of his PowerPoints from him. <laughs> well, these may look familiar to me. I borrowed heavily from, from him. Um, although I, I cut it back from, it was like 90 slides. Yeah. He had no really tall ones. Oh, you got my husband loves you.
exhausting but good. What was it on? It was, um, you heard of the double AMC? And that stands for American Academy of Medical Colleges. Okay. And I sit on their uh, postdoc steering committee. Oh, so okay. we talk a lot, we meet together with, we have a graduate education steering committee, a medical education steering committee, so on and so forth. And I went to their education annual meeting. Okay. So I was out in Chicago, so we talk a lot about um, topics going forward, talk a lot about FLSA, oh, well, way too much about FLSA, but a lot of career development stuff. Hey there. Uh, Who are you? Is that? I think we are. Okay, great. You must be Brian. I am Brian. I'm Lisa. Hey, Lisa. Very nice to see you. You too. I'm okay. hoping that we're all connected. We're streaming, we hope, to Hudson Alpha. Okay. Up in Okay. Yep. <laughs> Did go so well when we tried to do this over in Shelby. Yeah, I had a little webcam going, but... Do you don't you need webcam? Just sound? Um, you know, as long as they can hear us and see the slides, they don't need to see me. Okay. Trust me. Okay. They really don't. Okay. <laughs> They can see the slides. They can hear us. Sure I think we're recording. Yeah. Did you need to record? Okay. Uh, I think. I think we are. Yep. We are recording. All right. So the sound's going to come out of the TV. Okay. Your audio is coming through here. Cool. So you're good. Awesome. Thank you so yep. much. All right. And if they want to break in, they just unmute themselves and they can talk. And we can hear them. That's correct. I'll just leave them. How many do you think you're at now? Um, uh, it's just one group up at Hudson Alpha. Yeah. I just leave them. I leave them all unmuted. Okay. Okay. Because, yeah, I think they're just on one wall with you. Yep. So, perfect. Okay. Thanks. Thanks All for right. checking. Hey there. Come on in. Hi. Where is my slideshow? Just running through, make sure everything's working. Can't be much worse than last week, right? <sighs> I apologize. God, wait. That was not fun. Modern technology. The yeah. Soul something like, of the main of our No, I, I, I do wonder if it was something on their end. You can hear them soon. Yeah. They can see us. What do you think? Come on in. I like this. Isn't it cushy? Yeah, it's I'm, I'm, fancy. I'm, yeah. I wish it had like something. Um, so I was going to put tables in, but they have a form right after we're done where they have to organize oh, like this. Okay. So next time I'll have to. Okay. All right. That's going to be good. Yeah, <laughs> potentially our current position. I'm thinking if it works today, I think we go with it. I'm just saying. Yeah. Oh, I love the old school 19th century yeah. library thing. The wood bag. It's perfect. Warm. Warm to CCTS. <laughs> but yeah, so we talk a lot about career development. Um, so is it like for postdocs all over? So the AAMC is a um, a group of well, it's all medical schools essentially, okay. and so we come together to talk about policies, efforts going forward. How can we all work together? So it's like nationwide mm -hmm. medical schools. Yep, yep. So I I only go to the smaller meeting of, of education. There's an enormous annual clinical meeting in November. Um, that's huge. I can't do my best on the mm -hmm. Um Hello. Hello. Hey there. This is Ada Sterling. How are you? Hey, Ada. <laughs> what are you doing? <laughs> Be okay? okay? Yes. Can you hear me? <laughs> we can hear you. I think we're gonna hear okay. I think it, it will probably be best if you you on your end. All right. Would that be okay? Hopefully that'll solve the feedback. I think it has. They can still do the chat. That will automatically pop up or they can unmute and ask a question directly. I'm going to email you, Ada, just to make sure everything's, everything's working. 
Let's see, I know the new link. Can you still hear us? You should just be able to see the slides. To see slides. You have to leave it three, not a problem. No worries. You should have the slides and you have the, the activity link at the very last slide, which we were going to do. Hey there. How are you? If you want to chat uh, by typing, that should you can go ahead and try that and that should pop up on our end and we should be able to see you. We have a new number for phoning in. Yes. Yeah. We can record. Yes. We're in the 21st century. So this will be our new home. The next time we'll have tables. Okay. Hey, Krista or Ada, can you email me just to make sure we're all in contact? Hey, Sparkle. How are you? Or we want to go ahead and unmute yourselves just to make sure that we are connected. Oh, there's a sign in the back and a handout. Make sure the handout's on the chair. Um, slides and uh, the chapter from the Agent to My book um, for today. Oh, yeah. Okay. Oh, okay. <laughs> Yeah. 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 Hello. Hello. Can you hear us? We can. We can. Okay. Then I'm, going going to the I'm going to mute us again. Oh, perfect. Perfect. Okay. Thank you. So the kids over the top of the Was it both of the I don't know. Yeah. I mean, how something wrong, right? Like, yeah, I thought it just hits one person. One and not the other. Yeah. yeah. But she actually called that Wednesday, and then I sent her on Thursday. She got home Thursday night, and she's sick again. Oh. So we were out Friday. Ugh. I think I pushed it. Yeah. You know, it's hard. Oh, isn't she oh. Yeah. She's in there. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. And that's a two-year-old. So he's the one that I was really nervous. And if he gets it, it's a whole different story. Yep. I know. I know. Yeah, mine are two years apart, too. Okay. My name is Stephanie Collins. It's great. It's great, though. Yeah. That's fun. Yeah. That's not right now. They play well together. So my, my older one, she's now 17. Okay. Um, we have a much younger, she's the older of the two. She used to dress up her brother. And we would take pictures. We'd have them in the vault. And we'd bring them out. I'll make that rehearsal dinner. That's what I'm thinking. A little more than that. No. No. We're going to make sure. <laughs> We're still all coming in and getting settled, so we'll start in a couple minutes. Yeah, 
Like yeah, asking them, can we get us? Yeah, because yeah. they were having the same issues. So could you, uh, um, so we could hear them, yeah. see them. Okay. They could see us. So, turn our slides. Let's move it to here. They're all well. Yeah, you can see the mics in the room yeah, all right. over. So it'll be much better. They're supposed to renovate Shelby 105 to be like this. Oh. Okay. Hopefully sometime next year. Hey, come on in. Thank you all for, for coming to PCAMS. This will be our new home. Yeah, we're going to get going right on the tick of two because they have to leave out at three. We'll keep going, but that way they'll get as much as they can. Of course, if we could do this outside, <laughs> it is so unbelievably beautiful out there. Unbelievable. Alright. So has anyone downloaded the HHMI book? It's a free PDF. I did a while back. Good. The restrooms, yes, are out and across the hallway around the corner there. Come on in. Make sure you grab handouts that are in the back. Okay. Chairs are a little more comfortable, a little bit more steady. So for those of you who have at Hudson Alpha, we have moved rooms, as you can probably tell. That is, um, this room that we're in is completely outfitted for this purpose. So we're going we're gonna to loop here now, I think, for the next few weeks. Um, all works well, I hope, and definitely let us know on your end if you run into any, any issues. Um, I think we have one person who may have stepped out for a second, but um, we're going to go on and get ahead, get going, I guess. So before um, we start, any, any questions? And uh, Hudson Alpha, I know we're going to try and hopefully connect maybe over a lunchtime to uh, walk through um, the uh, lecture from two weeks ago that was boggled so badly. But um, I would love to catch you up, and, and I know you have the slides and so forth, but that would be fun. So we're going to go ahead, come on in, and uh, get started. There are handouts in the back. So today is all about data management. And so the handouts that you have, certainly a copy of the slides, along with a relevant chapter from the HHMI text on uh, data management. And I, I have to start off this lecture um, with a remembrance, if you will. Uh, my chair, my former chair, who recruited me about 100 years ago, um, passed away six years ago. And in fact, he gave this lecture uh, just a couple of weeks. It was very sudden for those of you who may have known or knew of him. Um, and so I thought it would be appropriate and uh, bittersweet to, um, to use his slides mostly and uh, update it, of course. But to remember him in this way, because data management was a, an amazing passion for him. It was all about publication ethics and so, so on and so forth. So I wanted to do that at the outset, and I know that he borrowed, um, and it's now not working. No, it's late. What? Okay. There we go. Moment. Moment of panic. Um, he coordinated, stay by the mic. Um, this, this lecture with certainly other collaborators as well, both of whom I think have retired. I know Charlie certainly has. Um, but they too were very instrumental in a lot of the policies now that shape UAB's uh, outlook and, and use of, of data and data management, particularly for uh, scientific ethics queries. So we'll talk a little bit about that. So by the end of today, always good to start off with learning objectives. You should be able to understand what data management is all about but importantly, why it's important. Um, we're going to talk about approaches to data management, look at uh, one particular resource, which will be our activity at the end, that I think you'll find useful. Um, and that will be fun about how to craft, really, a lab management plan. So for you Bob Dylan fans out there, I'm way dating myself. Um, but this is a quote on um, paperwork and research. Hey, handouts in the back. And, and really 
Dean Barrett, I, I'm, I'm sure none of your labs look like this, or none of your mentors' offices look like this, right? You just stacks of papers, but I know exactly where that paper is that I need. It's in the third stack from the left, right? But really, it has just gone and exploded um, exponential. So why is data important? Right? We generate data, and hopefully objectively, should be objectively, but we use that data to, to interpret and gain information about a particular experiment, a particular area, certainly, of research. Because that's the point of research, right, is to generate knowledge in this field. And so we really have to take care of that data, manage it well, so that we can ultimately generate now knowledge that's, that's accurate. You've probably heard a lot about rigor and reproducibility of late. It's, it's the huge effort now really driven in part by, by the NIH, that there have been certainly um, several high-profile studies that have not been um, reproduced, had to be retracted. Why do you think that is? Why? What would play into reproducibility, per se? Rigorous controls. Rigorous controls. So, go ahead. The protocols were documented rather than maintained, so nobody knew how to. So are, are protocols data? Wow. They are, actually. Yeah. Right, because they, they are part of, of that whole experiment. So that you know is, is in part the big issue with regard to reproducibility. You could use the same strain of mice for a particular experiment, well, what if they're kept at different temperatures or different light-dark cycles because that's what the ARP staff is doing, right? That could play into, so questions of that. So being, being able to document and include that as a piece of data is absolutely necessary for that reproducibility piece. So these are actually pictures from, from Dale's old lab, and he would have these just stacks and stacks. Of, of notebooks. Hey there, we've got handouts in the back. Stacks and stacks of notebooks. And I think you can probably see, I hope you can, that they are all cataloged in, in some way. I have to say, mine never looked this great, but his certainly did. As I say, he had a passion. And they were all well, well labeled with the person's name who generated the data, certainly the dates, um, where that was done, um, contact information, periods of time, so on and so forth. Just incredible. If you were to open up each one of these binders, you would then see a table of contents, beautifully written out. Um, again, mine weren't this beautiful, but we did have table of contents. So that's just, you know, uh, again, an approach. Because inevitably, when you have your own labs, you will be there 10 o'clock at night because the grant's due in a few days. Everybody else is gone, but you need this one piece of data, and you should be able to put your hands and eyes on it immediately. You should be able to walk into the lab, go to that person's bench, find the notebook, go to this, and get exactly what you need. That's why, in part, this is so important. Jump in with questions. Hudson Alpha, feel free to chat or unmute if you need to. So then he um, you would, should also have uh, a periodic summary that wonderfully illustrates what constructs in this example were used, the name of the construct, perhaps where it came from, more than just how much you used. Um, definitely, you know, lot numbers, things of that sort. I mean, fetal calf serum, right? I mean, fetal calf serum can differ greatly between lots, right? Yeah. Uh, just like for an example, like sometimes like uh, in a one lab, the company would give them different batches of fetal calf serum and let them see yes. how it affects their proliferation before they do it. And you buy that lot. And, and you buy the lot out. Yeah. That's exactly out. right. So. You have it on reserve. Yes. We would do that too. Is that the right thing to do? Again, it gets back to reproducibility. What's in that serum that's driving your cells crazy? It's a great question, but at the end of the day, we need to just get a paper out so you can get the grant in. Da, 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 da. You got to get the work done, right? So, importantly, just write it down. Make sure it is it is summarized somewhere. 
so that you'd be able to go back and reproduce and, and again, share that with your, your colleagues. So just outlined here, certainly the experimenter, um, name, date of the experiment, and you can go ahead and see that. But importantly, to add this piece at the end, what are the next steps? So you've got your results, you've got your interpretations and conclusions. What's next? So don't forget about this last piece to go back and reflect on, okay, what were the experiments that led up to driving this, this series of uh, inquiries? What are we going to do next? Right? So that's, that's part of the summary that I would encourage you to, to keep um, track of. Okay, blank slide. What are the advantages of a paper record, right? You can have a paper record or electronic record. We're going to talk about each. What are the advantages of the old-fashioned paper record? Anyone can access it who needs it. Exactly. Yeah. Um, well, I was always taught, you know, you write it on paper, you don't erase anything in pen, you don't cross it out because it's a valid thing where electronic can tamper with change. Well, I, and there are some some things, though, that have to be electronic. Yes. In terms of like, on my <laughs> well, there, there's that, or, or it's collected on a computer. Yeah. Right. Right. So, so but what what are some of the other advantages for paper? You can take notes while you're doing an experiment. Yes. Was, I mean, I guess with tablets now, maybe, but I don't want True. to look up on the True. Any other thoughts? More than likely, you won't lose it. I mean, the computer will crash, or you can lose foul, electronic foul. True. Or something can get spilled on the paper. Yeah. Okay, so it's just some, some thoughts. So it's pretty familiar. People are used to it, right? Very portable. It's unbreakable, but not completely, you know, perfect. Um, fast. I love this. It accepts multiple types of data, mm -hmm. and the financial department understands how to bill for it. I get that. It's a bound notebook. I know what that is. Well, we're going to talk about um, legal handling should you have any kind of ethics issue. Okay. Now, what are the disadvantages? Yeah, you saw the reams of bookcases, yeah. Uh, a lot of your data comes in computer form already, so you do a, a live site, comes in an Excel sheet, and mm -hmm. so you would have to either print it or copy it on paper. Okay. It's not going to last forever. It's not going to last forever. It's um, shareable. Mm -hmm. When it's not shareable on paper, it's usually you can't send it to a collaborator. True. It can be lost or complete or illegible. Can you read it? <laughs> One task and time storage, right? Exponential. Um, vulnerable to error, well, everything is. Uh, I would add here, too, it was an advantage listed as being portable. I think that's a disadvantage, too. Never take the lab book home. It can get lost. If you're in a car accident, heaven forbid, it could get torched. Um, the dog could eat it, um, right? <laughs> Seriously, <laughs> never take it out of the lab. So I, I would almost list that as a disadvantage as well. Some, sometimes. And I'll send out these complete slides too over email. Say how fun. So again, going back to the list, uh, this would be um, what his notes would look like. Again, you can see all of the, the tags and the names of the constructs that were, that were used, the dates that they were made, for example. Um, beautiful organization of all of the imagery. Again, um, well, well labeled. Uh, the magnification, incredibly important, right? Because that, too, would need to be recorded in a publication. <coughs> types of cells used, so on, so the types of stains. Um, and this is just a great explanation here of how to label a, um, uh, a film. I had this wonder, okay, personal anecdote, wonderful postdoc in my lab a few years back. 
and you get so excited and passionate about data. And you would come tearing into my office and you would have a film, great bands, no labels. Hey, I don't know what you're showing me. Oh, this is this and this. I'm like, mm-mm, get out. Come back when it's labeled. He did this three times and then I just, you can't come, you can never come in my office without it being labeled. I love you, but no. Mm -hmm. So it, critically important because you, you need to show them like, the weights, of course, the different lanes, and importantly, how it was done in terms of uh, developed, you know, different exposure times, so on and so forth. Put it right all in the film and then get it in the book. And preferably along with a chart of how it was done. Then you have everything right there. It's all summarized, all that you need for that paper or you know the grant late at night. It's right here. If you have any questions, you can go back and, and look. So a lot of this is, is pretty self-explanatory, makes sense, logical. Um, and then you have this. How many have done this? Of course. It's easier on the fly. You gotta get to class, or you gotta get to that seminar, you gotta go pick up the kids. Um, no, not good. Or this. Really? And it fades over time. You go back a couple of years later, and you go, oh, no idea what this says. Person who did it is long gone. They've gone on to their job or whatever. Um, don't don't let yourself get into this situation. So that's the paper version. So electronic. Right? Electronic content. More and more, a lot of the data feeds out, whether it's by computer or what have you, um, feeds out into an electronic record. So there is an electronic notebook system. Again, that will be our activity at the end. We can create, store, retrieve, so on and so forth. Um, everything. So, advantage is electronic. You usually type faster than you can write. Okay. <laughs> Sharing easily. Sharing easily. Exactly. Very, very useful. You can incorporate, like, let's say you do microscopy, you can just slap the pictures on as you go and sort of print with tape. Exactly. Right, from the OptiDoc, you can just feed it right in. Yep. I think a file directory is a lot easier to organize than a glossary. Mm -hmm. Very true. All of the above, right? Accessible from remote sites. People can um, work on it perhaps at the same time. You can search it pretty easily. Um, can link to protocols, customize it. Um, much more legible, yes. Uh, this is important, to facilitate continuity when staff turns over. So you have that record keep on going. People come and go, they do, but that stays. So then what are disadvantages? They get corrupted or hacked into and have data changed. Exactly. Windows 10. <laughs> <laughs> Say no more, right? Exactly. What about data entry? Yeah, no one's perfect. Sort of cost could be could be um, difficult. Learning curve, confidentiality, as you alluded to, not portable, but maybe more breakable sometimes. Mm -hmm. But importantly, who will enter the data? The data, and certainly downtime. So all. But then you can have it organized. What do you mean by downtime? If it crashes, oh, right, and you lose it, or you have to rebuild it, right. But you can beautifully organize it, definitely by date, not by, you know, um, archaic, uh, just uh, abbreviations or so on and so forth. Because if you don't know when it was done or who did it, you may not be able to use it at the end. And that would be such a waste of money. So take care in, in creating these file names or folder names so that you don't have to be thinking really late at night. You can just say, oh, yeah, that was, you know, so-and-so's in March of 09. I know exactly where it is. So, so it's 
easily organized, retrievable. Um, the data has integrity uh, over time. All good record keeping. So questions. How long, let's, we're going to walk through each of these separately. So how long do you need to keep the actual data, raw data? Who owns it? And what happens if you have to produce it? So how long do you keep it? Forever. <laughs> Just keep it forever. Seriously. So we'll walk through some of the different parameters or um, recommendations, if you will. The British Medical Research Council really has put forth a lot of these great policies that we borrow from to set policies here and elsewhere. But you never want to be audited or have to produce it for whatever reason, but act like you may have to, so that it's well organized, labeled, and so on and so forth. So they recommend that primary data should be retained for 10 years from the completion of the project. But really, you know, maybe health studies 20 years. So when you think clinical studies, what pieces go into that clinical study that you would then have to keep? Consent form. Consent form. And HIPAA waivers. That's the mm -hmm. There's usually a lot of paperwork. Whole amount of paperwork. Yeah, any surveys maybe they took. Uh, certainly print out, uh, printouts, rather, readouts of, of different measurements, so on and so forth. Yeah. 20 years. So but then everybody differs. So the FDA would say two years after shipment and delivery of the drug for investigational use is discontinued. Uh, or if state and federal guidelines are longer, then they default to the state. So NIH says three years from the date of the final expenditure report. But remember, some of these grants keep on going, right? When they get renewed, you still have to keep them because the project's not over. So the project could be going 25 years. They've got to have all of that data because that project is still ongoing. Uh, Alabama says seven years for POs and so forth, but seven years is the minimum. Uh, record retention. But then there are some journals that say that even after your paper is published, if that paper is then referenced seven years from that reference point. <laughs> so forever, right? Exactly. It's pretty much forever. But all journals differ, so keep it safe, keep it labeled, keep it organized. Again, more from uh, record keeping, the British Medical Research Council. So I think you probably all know this permanent binding uh, for those paper records. Separate uh, ring or um, binder or folder for any printouts or images that you then put in, like you had seen earlier. Enter the data as soon as possible. No little post-its stuck over the desk. Yep, my technician used to do that routinely. Drove me nuts. Enter it as soon as possible. Yeah. Question, going back to what we do here at UAB. Yeah. Um, I know usually a lab houses it, but it's not a lab, it's the university. Correct. So if a lab dissolves, is it then the department who takes over that responsibility? Yes. yes. They have to house it. Exactly right. Mm -hmm. You know, a great example. So. My husband and I, my husband is also a faculty in physiology, and then he left the university in 07 to start a company. So all of his data from the previous 10 years stayed in the department and is still there. And he's been gone. But it's theirs because it's UAB, and now it's the department's responsibility. Yeah. Well, what's the deal with, okay, I understand that the university owns that data, but it's like he worked on that data, he probably uses that data and knowledge that he gained from his education and his time there. It's like, does, doesn't he get to take a copy of it with him? Or so, what's the deal with that? So you can take a copy, um, and certainly as postdocs, once you finish training, you can take a copy of what you do to validate your productivity, certainly in the protocols as well but you can't take the, the actual raw 
printouts, for example, that stays here. That's a permanent record here. But yes, you can take a copy. Good questions. So how many have mentors who regularly check your notebooks and sign off on them? How many mentors come through? Do you remember in, in undergrad where you had to have like your lab books on the end of the class? No. Yeah. Oh, we didn't. Yeah, way back when, like in class. Yeah. Yeah, yeah so you would just actually show up. <laughs> so you would show up, right. Do your mentors now, do they ever look at your notebooks? Encourage them to. Um, when you're a mentor, definitely look at them, look at the notebooks. So when we met last, I think we talked about this time when I had a student who he ended up leaving with a master's, but it turns out he was, he was doing investing on the side and in the lab and not doing the work. I didn't check his notebooks, and he was not putting anything in the notebook. So when lab meeting would come around, you know, he wouldn't have anything or he would only have graphs of, you know, percent changes, not the actual raw data. I didn't look at his notebooks, and I got burned. It, it, it took me a few times of like, you know what, I have to check on this person and I need to look at it almost every day. So get into that habit, encourage your mentors to do that. I know it's oh, maybe mm -hmm. once a week even, but just to make sure that things are up to date and, and being organized in a way so that when you need to go back and find that information, you can put your hands and eyes on it. You, know, you should be able to do that. That's, that's your life. Definitely look at the notebooks. Don't be. <laughs> and regularly back it up on a drive if it's electronic, whether it's an external hard drive or on a flash, what have you. Make sure you have backup. Certainly you need to, um, if you're using potentially hazardous substances, um, whether it's like a BS level 3 type thing or even radioactive materials, for example to make sure that they are organized, um, there's a log, occupational health, or radio, radio, um, radioactive folks will come around and need to see that information. It's really consent forms we, we mentioned. Remember, all of these things are data, not, not just the actual printouts or numbers, but the reagents that you use, the protocols that you use them in, those are all part of the data that go into into the experiment. So we talked about who owns the data kind of already. Uh, so here it's UAB. No matter if the grant is from the NIH or from American Heart or what have you, ultimately it's done in UAB space, really with UAB resources and UAB people. It's UAB's data. You can make a copy, as mentioned, um, but it belongs to the university. Question. Yes. Uh, so I work with a collaborator who's within driving distance. Yes. Um, so I go there uh -huh. and they, um, I keep possession of the samples at all times so they have to do any type of material transfer. Uh, okay. But they, you know, perform the experiments, generate the data, like have all the raw numbers and stuff. Mm -hmm. But who, you know, like, it's my data, but you know, and like I know for authorship how that works, but sure. how does that work for... So who provides the funds to do the work? I don't know, both. Both. Because their equipment and it's expensive. So I, I would say then that there's but both... But it's our tissue and that's also... Work. So that, that's a true collaboration. There probably should be an MTA to protect you both for that. Um, but that's definitely co-owned, if you will. I mean, there are pieces that are owned by each institution uh, for this collaboration. But just to, to protect you and the institutions, there probably should be an MTA in place okay. or some kind of subcontract uh, or yeah. however that money flows. Yeah. Just to paper it up, just to be safe. Okay. So, what if you get in a pickle and you need to produce these research records, be it be a paper or electronic, what do you do? There's an inquiry of ethics. You've been asked to produce records. What do you do? Can I know? 
Yeah, bet or produce them. It's in your best interest. Definitely produce them. So this is where all of that organization comes in. Heaven forbid, it will never, yeah. So when somebody asks for that kind of stuff, like I'm assuming in order for it to develop one of the original records. Correct. Well, like if you're recording it digitally, what constitutes the validity of an original record? It would have to, it's probably time stamped, and this is where they get the um, forensic computer specialists involved. They do. They do. Okay, so that's sufficient enough for them. Yes, they, they would want the, the original, I mean, they will come in and they will take uh, computers. Um, they will take anything that they need to, to validate that data. Well, that's my other question. Are they, is the, do they typically just want the files, or are they going to physically seize assets to obtain this? Data? All of the above. Okay. Yep. So, so first one is misconduct, right? So how many of you have taken the 717 or the refresher course that or class that I do for the orientation? Yeah. Okay, so you've heard about FFP, the fabrication, falsification, and plagiarism. So certainly making up data, stealing data, stealing words or ideas. Uh, that, that's classic, right? Misconduct. So UAB also layers on this part that I've underlined. Deviating from those practices that are commonly accepted in the scientific community for proposing or reporting conducting research. So what does that mean? Commonly accepted. Vague, isn't it? <laughs> Cynical, yes, I know. Um, so it could be withholding information, right? Um, relevant to an investigation or even bringing malicious charges against someone. So it has happened. I'm going to show you a few examples here. Some that happened at UAB. This one was, was pretty well known. Has anyone heard of this guy from UVM, Eric Pullman? This is back in 05. Sorry? Yes, I remember this one. You remember this one? Big one. Yeah, he was a med school professor of fabricating research on menopause. Um, fraudulently received over a half million dollar grant from the NIH, so this is what, 10 years ago. Good job with you. So I blew the whistle on him, and at this reporting, it said he could get up to five years in prison and be fined. In fact, he was the very first case scientist to go to prison. He went for a year and a day, and then had to uh, retract all his papers, and certainly was barred from federal funding ever again. What do you think he's doing today? <laughs> he's an academic advisor in Montreal. Oh my goodness. Okay, it's not that far from Burlington. I get that. Mm. Okay. Next. Probably you've heard of this one. This is a little more well known. Yep. A few years back. Um, South Korean researcher who claimed to have cloned human cells. Fabricated evidence. I mean, it was stunning, right, that he could do this. The world was aflame and discussion, ethics, and morals, and all of that. It turns out it was all a hoax, essentially. UAB has not escaped this. Uh, this is reported in the Baltimore Sun a long time ago. Um, I just can't wrap my head around this, but it was it was about a um, a drug to defeat. I think it was it must have been psoriasis. Sorry, patches in his body. Um, skin cancer. Skin cancer. Sorry, but it was a lie. Oh, yeah, here we go. <laughs> they knew it was a lie. That's abysmal. This was a little more recent here. I don't know if you know this one, Judy Thompson and Juan Contreras. They're actually fired from UAB for, for this work. And you can go and look this up and read more on your own. But they were uh, doing some transplant studies. And in fact, I, if I remember correctly, it was either a clinical fellow or a postdoc that blew the whistle on, um, on these studies. Um, 
They were both fired. Juan was barred from federal funding for three years, Judy for 10. Um, I think Juan went into to, uh, private practice, as I recall. But essentially, it was confusion over how the protocols were performed and the controls that were, that were done. Um, that turned out to be incorrect and knowingly so. Making a mistake is one thing. Okay, malice of forethought is another, knowing that you're doing wrong. An honest mistake is just that. You're not going to get, you know, fired for an honest mistake. Everybody's human. But doing this intentionally, not good. But it happens, happens here. Yeah? I was say, I feel like that kind of stuff gets underreported just because the people involved with it, like they feel like their you know, employment's at stake or, you know, what is, especially it's the grad students that are most... So important. we're going to talk a little bit about that in just a moment. In just a moment. But, yeah, in terms of reporting, you're making an allegation. So what's the cost when this happens? Grant money for not going to... Grant money? The time for the legal investigation. Mm -hmm. You start distrusting the scientific community as a whole. Right. Mm -hmm. And the patients that lose faith and then run on clinical trials. Right. So you're, you're talking about all the stakeholders, though. Certainly the science community at large, patients, the institution, um, federal, federal grants, trainees. Yeah. Uh, I was wondering with like the previous example of misconduct, you said, you know, they're barred from applying for federal funding for like 10 years. Mm -hmm. But if you had that mark on your record, I mean, do you realistically have a chance of getting federal funding again? Who's going to give you a job? That's kind of what I thought. So it's like... Who's going to give you a job related to research? Okay. Has there ever been a case of somebody getting funding after they got suspended from funding? Um, probably so. I'm not familiar. You're shaking your head. I don't remember a specific example, but there are some where mm -hmm. you know, an advisor, he was on a review panel mm -hmm. for someone who had been convicted but then could reapply. But huh. because this advisor knew his own bias, he right. had recused himself. Wow. But yeah, still would be a plus. You know, you could go to the NIH website, the ORI, Office of Research Integrity, and they have a listing out by year those cases that have gone forward. Not that are alleged but or in in or, or pending but those that have had a negative outcome. Those are posted. What's the autism judge doing right now? I'm sorry? Well, he was still active in some capacity. Who's that? The guy that tried to show the link between autism and vaccines. Oh, yeah, he's in Britain. We don't care about him. <laughs> I'm kidding. No, I believe he's, he published in, in the Lancet. Yeah, Is I, think that I think he's still active. But, but answering the question, I thought he was still in some capacity. But I, I thought he was British. Yeah. 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 So I, I don't. He won't be on the ORI website. It's fine. But your point is well taken, though. I mean, that that was a fabrication. So we've listed out the cost. That was a big cost. Huge. Still, cost. still, I mean, the ripples around the world, and kids not getting vaccinated. Really. I mean, now we've had you know blow ups of mumps. And uh, that's, the, that's, that's, I mean, that's a case in point of trusting McCarthy before you trust your dog. Right. So. A lot of playboy blah, blah, blah. <laughs> it's on the internet. It must be true. <laughs> it must be. <laughs> right. So, but we, we've touched on a lot of that impact on journals, the literature, certainly reputations, um, and that, that possibility of criminal uh, impact. So, right, so seemingly insignificant items can be misconduct. Making a slight change in data results, darkening a slide, paraphrasing, that would be the plagiarism piece. And it, it can happen to anyone, right? Anyone can do it. Yeah? I mean, there are so many tools now that uh, journals use in particular to determine if there are changes in um, images, if they've been manipulated or constructed in some way. You can look at different tones of the film, for example. Um, journals have gotten incredibly sophisticated with their tools, and they look at every, I mean, it just used to be a few journals now, 
uh, HAP, Journal of Physiology, was probably one of the forerunners of it. But it's across every journal now. They will look at every figure um, to ensure that it's, it's real. If it happens to you, uh, determine the facts. They will take this up, up the scientific records, looking at the data. I mean, certainly the best defense is a good offense if you have organized and cataloged and been careful. You have nothing to worry about. But if you haven't and you can't produce that data, you know, they, um, it won't go well. So a few examples. Really, the dog ate my data, right? Uh, this is really funny. A former NSF program officer plagiarized material from a proposal submitted by another PI, blamed his misconduct on several factors, time pressure, sloppy editing, and a computer malfunction that occurred. Dale was so forward thinking. This is his life. <laughs> Um, certainly, other practices that, again, deviate from that commonly accepted practice. I mean, you should know um, specifics of your field of study as to what's accepted in regard to protocols. Uh, certainly, unawareness of research practices is not an excuse. But again, poor record keeping. That's why we're here today. Right? Have to keep those records. So how are allegations made? Anybody can be a whistleblower. They can do this anonymously. There's actually an anonymous tip line um, through um, the Office of Research, the Marquesas Office. Certainly the graduate school can, can feel those, those allegations as well, albeit in an anonymous form. But anyone, if they have a concern, can raise that. Um, so then it starts, once that has been done and it has I won't say been validated, but thought to be real of, of import. That sorts of process of assessment, inquiry, investigation, and then the final, final analysis. I have been on a uh, inquiry committee. It's gut-wrenching. I really want to get sick because, I mean, it, it took months. We were just assessing if there was evidence to go forward for a full investigation. I didn't even get into that investigation, which can take years. The Judy Thomas one took years, absolutely years. Talk about a time sink. Um, but you have to, you know, on this type of inquiry committee, um, the ethics office will take all that they need. They will take records, uh, laboratory records, notebooks, proposals, progress reports, all of these documents, they wanted all, mountains and boxes of documents. You know, this inquiry committee had myself and two other faculty members. We had to go through all of these records. Um, you have to look at all the electronic records. So the, again, they will come in, they, the ethics uh, officers will come in, they will take the computers, they will close down the lab. Um, they will take any and all records that they can find that pertain to, to this in, uh, inquiry. Um, what happens while the inquiry and the investigation is going on? Like, are there, is it up to the discretion of the university to fire the? Because I know that like, they're not they're not fired yet because there's no final right. action that's right. been decided. But that lab can be closed for a time. Okay. Yep. And then are like, are they given their salaries? Yes. The, like yes. Yes, they, 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 they are still receiving their salary. I mean, this is working through this allegation and assessment process. But while all of that is being assessed, it likely will definitely hamper their ability to do work, right? Um, so they'll take personal laptops, whatever they deem necessary to, to get the answer. Yeah? So with this inquiry, I'm just curious, what were the, are you aware of the circumstances that brought about the need to investigate this? Or there was an anonymous allegation made of misconduct. That's all I can say. Yep. And so the, the assessment and inquiry committee uh, goes through all of these pieces of, of information to say yes or no, we believe something has 
Hey, Don, something that doesn't smell right, something looks not right. Then that's turned over to an investigating that then goes and interviews people and it gets papers are retracted or put on hold. I mean, that impacts certainly grad students and postdocs. Your ability to progress is yeah, not true. So, right, any, any of the paper records, electronic records, um, anything, uh, specimen protocols. Take care of How much substantiation has to be used to investigate an anonymous claim of somebody who might just have a good data? So, that What's is right? assessed as well. Um, so, as a part of that exploration, if you will, those people are questioned to determine um, their, uh, if the allegation is made anonymously, then you really... Yeah, I didn't know what you meant by, like, it's not like an anonymous phone call of cops. Is that what you mean? Like, it's an like, anonymous tip. Right. I think you need to look at so-and-so because he or she has been doing X. And so, you go in and you, they, 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 they assess that. Um, if they can find out who's made an, uh, a malicious comment, then that they can act upon that because that itself is misconduct, right? Right, but then it would be anonymous because the PI would know right. who did it. Well, I, I'm saying if yeah. they do know who brought that comment forward and it was done in a malicious act, then that itself is misconduct uh, okay. against the person who brings it, right? But if it is completely anonymous, and there's smoke, and then you find fire, they go forward with a full investigation. You look befuddled. But there's no real accountability for the person that made the anonymous tip if their identity remains anonymous? Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that's why if you have everything organized, labeled, well-maintained, that's the best offense that you have. I'm just trying to wrap my head around an anonymous tip and then you waste months investigating this lab for nothing. Potentially. But if there's nothing there, then it ends there. But Correct? it could just be sloppiness that the person tried it to It could be. Of. It could be. No, you're right. I, I know a crazy person that, <laughs> that, that we had problems with. Is where I'm going with this. Yeah. It, it could be sloppiness. So if you're not sloppy, Right, and, and the ethics people come in and they say, wow, you know, this is, there's nothing here. Stop it. And you don't have to worry about it. But yeah, it's all about trust. It's all about trust. So basically, it's anything in the lab. It's fair game. They can look at it. In the office. Question. Yes. You know, not supposed to take the phone. Right. But people do. Yep. Do they then have the right to enter your home in these kinds of investigations? If, if something is missing and they think it may be destroyed or that you're hiding it, I would they could probably get something. I, I don't know. I've not seen or heard it go that far, thankfully. But um, I have heard of hard drives being destroyed. Yep. Yep. It's sickening, really. I mean, these are your colleagues, right? You want them. Yeah. Now, the benefit to the digital copy, though, is probably another copy somewhere. Potentially. Potentially. Yes. Should be, if they're not sloppy. Right? So here, destruction or absence of response, failure to produce for the questions uh, is evidence of misconduct, right? So you go on and read for. Um, but they've got, you've got to produce it. You've got to produce it. So again, at the end of the day, you need to ensure the integrity of your data. Design and manage the projects in a fashion that adheres to professional standards. And now this rigor reproducibility that the NIH has put forward, it hasn't applied to training grants yet, but it's coming. I learned that at the meeting in Chicago last week. It is coming. You've probably heard of rigor and reproducibility now, but those are mainly for the R awards right now. But they are coming to training grants too. Familiarize yourself with uh, RCR and certainly make research data integral to publicly reported results um, in a timely manner. 
So all that to say, establish those data management plans. Don't be sloppy, be organized. It's your best offense in case you know something were to go sideways. Um, you'd be you'd be ready for that. So I know our our counterparts at Hudson Alpha have to scoot out in a little bit in a few minutes, but I thought this would be um, a fun activity to do right now. Um, so if you brought your laptops or tablets, um, you can go to this website. And it's actually an electronic notebook. I want you to get your stuff out. So Hudson Alpha, do you have any questions? Are you still there? You can chat or unmute if you like. We're good. Yeah. We're good. We're good. We're good. We're good. We're good. Great. So you have the link there um, in your slides that I sent up, so you can try it now. I know you have to scoot off to uh, a reception, um, but otherwise, uh, we'll we'll see you next week, or talk with you next week. I think we'll continue to use this room so that we have better connection. Thanks all. Okay, do y'all have your laptop up? Logged in. So this is an electronic notebook project out of Oak Ridge. That's pretty cool. It's free, it's probably the best part. Um, but new software, you can you can go and do the reading, but you can do a demonstration. Very cute. So if you go to this link. So this is the username demo and password is, is enter. Demo. Enter. Hopefully I typed one. No. Okay. So if you go to contents, and this is something you can play around with. This is me. So those are the features. Let's add something. Okay. Okay, Donald. Okay, mm -hmm. it's a presidential experiment. Keywords. Thank you. Oh. the Y. It does start with a Y. Pardon. Thank you. I'm being. I'm just being silly now, but. So you can go and you can upload a file, um, different types of images if you want to upload. Let's see, let's start over. Should allow me to go back. Notarize something. Not sure how that works. So I thought it might be fun to play around with it if you wanted to. We could. Um, Mine's not opening. It's not opening. Well, like I go to the notebook and uh -huh. click it and it just gives me a 404. Could be a double what, um, what platform are you on? Windows. Windows. Okay. Um, are you using Google or? Yeah, it's Chrome. I'll show you something else. Okay. I'll try it. Okay. Can you share this? You should be able to. And you can get the um, you can get the free software. You just email them, and they'll send you the software free. Test page. How secure is this? Probably not so much if it's free, right? Now, there are a number of different plans out there that you can certainly purchase. Um, there are a number of different ones. A simple Google, we can do that in actual. I just started using one and I'm 
Yeah. For what? Want to know? Oh, okay. Not as like my primary thing, but just uh -huh. like keep track of stuff. Let's go back. I cannot type. Here we go. Let's do. Ah. So if something like this, I think we would definitely be probably more secure, it looks to be. Um, so as we were talking about when we talked about budget, that would be something you would have to add in to your long list when you start negotiating for a startup. Or perhaps your department may have a type of data management resource or software that they've, you know, purchased in bulk, if you will, in terms of access. That um, also would be more easy to share. But I assume UAB does not have a recommended system. Not that I know of. They should. SharePoint. Mm -hmm. I think it's SharePoint. Is it SharePoint? I'm pretty sure. But they, hmm. yeah, but they aren't very, very No, they're not. I mean, I've, I've wrestled with SharePoint. Yeah. But I, I don't see that more so as, as a data management. That's more of like a file sharing thing, you know? You know, or something where you can upload images, data, put in those protocol details um, would be a great use. Yeah. yeah. So is there any standard as far as data management in terms of like backups? Like so, you know, you can have everything on a hard drive or mm -hmm. something, but what is there a recommended or some sort of liability for you to have multiple copies in different locations and different formats? You need redundancy, like is there some guidelines to how many existent copies of your some data. Back it up. You can back it up a few different ways, put it in a few different places, but there is no particular you must do this recommendation if you will, or requirement, I should say. Back it up two or three ways. Um, you know, think about when you were writing your dissertation. Did you back it up? Oh yeah. <laughs> I did too. I printed it out. I put it in different places. Yeah, same thing for your data. I was curious, yeah. open up to how many people have done anything related to an industry and how that process differs from what we typically experience in the research setting in academics. Questions or comments? So there's something called um, Good Laboratory Practice or GLP right. training, um, which you may be familiar with. Uh, a lot of that's project management project management as well, um, but there you have to sign off notebooks every day. Yep, that's part of that GLP practice. Mm -hmm. And all of these elements have to be there. Legally, in my grad school, we had to do that, mm -hmm. and um, it was a really big lab, and every experiment was associated with the number of your notebook and the page number, so like when help us track samples because you get lots of samples that are frozen or in the fridge or whatever, slides. So everything was supposed to have that experiment number so that it can track back to your mm -hmm. lab notebook. And same for electronic files, um, you would associate that everything basically would 
have that number. So like if you went online or on the community mm -hmm. on computer and searched for that number, you could get the um, like electronic files and stuff associated with that experience. So it was the same tag ID that could then track. Oh, that's nice. Yeah, that's a great idea. Say, um, or sign off on I still do that and it helps me like because you'll go back six months later and look in the freezer and I see that number and I'm like oh I wonder what this is and I can go back mm -hmm. to my notebook and I know what's in the box so I don't know. But that raises a good point but too. That's GLP yeah. standards right? Mm -hmm. So by labeling your samples, whether it's in the fridge or the, or, or the freezer, mm -hmm. you know, to make sure that you know what they are. I, I know when I was in grad school, my mentor, we would be in fear when he opened the fridge because he would just start tossing things. If they were not labeled to his, you know, recommendation and, and what he wanted to see, in the trash. In the trash. He'd become, oh, weeks, months, gone. He's like, well, you don't know what it is. It's not labeled. It could be anything. Gone. Okay. You don't. You you, you remember that. <laughs> oh, you remember that. Um, but exactly right. That's part of the GLP. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Other questions. I was just sort of wondering because we hear more about misconduct in the research setting compared to the industry setting. So it seems that you know, industry has these mechanisms that weed these things out before they get to that stage research. And they have to because they ultimately want to go to the FDA, right, right? To, to cash in on their on their drug of choice. And the FDA needs all of that uh, in place. Yeah. Good point. Yeah. Yeah, I remember it too, like we were working on some patentable stuff. And I mean like the consideration of mine was that write it as if you will have to turn it over, not something you can dress up later to keep you know, so write it so someone else can read it mm -hmm. so pretty much. In your yeah. <laughs> you know, I, I had a, a postdoc, great postdoc, um, wonderful project, great data, but when he was almost finishing up and, you know, we we're looking at notebooks and so forth, it became clear that um, what I had presumed was logical or order. In fact, he had switched around um, and I couldn't follow it. So although every all the information was there, it had been jumbled, if you will. So with the postdoc that had just come on to extend that project, we ended up going back and repeating everything just to be sure. They were both co-first author. Um, but we did that to be sure because they all got jumbled. You know, as you saw at the end of the day, you just have your name in the trust. And so you have to make sure that things are in place. Other questions? All right, then. I think we'll be here for the remainder of, of our class meetings. Uh, we'll have tables next time because they, had a form, they have a forum in a little bit. So um, I think this works. Thank you all. And if you find you know, like a really cool data management system, share it next week. That'd be fun. I think we do the occupational health person next week. So she'll 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 scare you. Oh yeah, that's her job. Did you see those slides? Okay. <laughs> So uh, I think the consensus was that people would really look for that seasoned uh, manager. <laughs> yeah. So we broke out in groups and we um, actually identified different questions we would ask from the interview. Grad student or supposed to have two types of lab managers, either brand new or seasoned. I think a lot of the consensus was just that. Just that person. Because if you're new to the place, that person will know 
all the people you need to know that will save you time and ultimately money to make those connections. And is it true that lab manager, that title, is not part of the research yeah. staff? So I was all about, I, I knew that was that question, I had the slide ready, and then it came through I was on this email thread. It completely tore up that ladder. Secure for a really health care. And they're redoing it. But you can Uh huh. The whole research trial? Oh, I, I thought it took effect Sunday. It's, it's not. It's not yet. If you go to that website, and I have a link in the slides, I can remember. Yeah. Link they're not doing that. Science, yeah. science they're, they're rebuilding it. They're tearing apart and putting it back together. I've not seen that kind of one go out. Well, you know, really, but we thought we had one. But lab manager isn't part of that, right? It's not. It's its own. It's its own separate part. But I think my understanding is that it is to be one of those ones on the left. Okay. Well, we're, we're still like waiting. There's a lot to be worked out there. I know a lot of people that were not happy. There are a lot of people that are frustrated and confused. We need to be one of them. Yeah. Because communications aren't lining up. Do you still have a lot? I closed it down a year ago. Oh, okay. When I had the opportunity yeah. to go full time in the grad school. Okay. I kind of jumped out. Like, Do you yeah. miss that? I had some identity issues a little bit. Um, <laughs> I, I, I do miss it yeah. sometimes, but um, yeah, I'm having really tons of fun doing what I'm doing yeah. here, except for the FLSA part, but uh, everything else is great. <laughs> um, Thanks for asking. I would love you to come to the street because okay. I'm doing great uh, training, this is training too. Super. So, okay. Well, I'll make sure you, we send some slides and again. So, yeah. I think it is Donna Williamson from Occupational Health will be here. Okay. So, um, will I be able to get the slides? We're going to record it. Aha, uh -huh. you can go back and look at the recording. I just have to figure out where they're stored so I can share them. All right, so um, uh, I should have just sent you an email asking yes. for the Please do. presentation. Turn on. Right. Thanks. Super. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, how are you? Sure. So let's say you were